Hello, everyone. Welcome to our ICNCI online seminar. Uh, the subject for today is managing teams in turbulent times. Um, and before we start, and before I introduce our speaker, I would kindly ask you to uh, make sure that your mics are muted all through so that there would not be a background noise when we're doing the recording. Second, we will do the recording as usual, and it will end up on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, third, at the end of the session, we would ask all of you to open up your cameras so that we can get the group photo. Um, during the uh, presentation, uh, Dwight will uh, provide us with all the information that he's provided for us. And whenever you have a question in mind, please add it to the chat. By the time Dwight finishes his presentation, I will also moderate the questions and I'm sure that he'll be, ab he'll be able to answer all your questions. Again, thank you for being with us. I know that it's going to be a very um, informative uh, session and would like to introduce uh, our speaker. Most of you may already know him, but um, Dwight is an author of many papers and publications, one of which is a book titled The Effective CEO, The Balancing Act That Drives Sustainable Performance. Other than being an author, Dwight is also a researcher and an international speaker. But as a management consultant, Dwight is the founder and president of Effective Managers, a management consulting firm based in Canada that provides services globally through a network of consulting firms. And I believe most of you already know that Dwight is the current chair of ICMCI. He holds the CMC designation and was recognized a few years ago as a fellow CMC by CMC Canada. So this is our speaker for today. I know, again, as I said before, that it's going to be a very informative session. And Dwight, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Rima. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, address everyone today, and, and thanks for, for logging in. Uh, the topic is a bit different today. This is the, uh, the fifth in, uh, in the series that uh, ICMCI has put on, and usually I'm sitting where, where Rima is, so thank you, uh, Rima, for uh, moderating. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, this this topic arose from uh, a blog that I uh, wrote uh, not too long ago for my for my clients in terms of how one manages during disruption. Uh, COVID nineteen, of course, our current pandemic is is a major disruption uh, across all sectors, all industries, and it affects our 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 uh, our industry of management consulting also uh, very directly. So I, uh, uh, the, the blog, which you can see on my website, is really around how does one manage change uh, during a crisis and how does one manage their teams during a crisis? And um, thinking of managing, when I talk about manager, I'm talking about whether you're the head of the organization, uh, whether you're uh, an executive or whether you're a manager, all of those people have to manage their teams. So there's, uh, there's leadership and management are, are two sides of a coin. Uh, everyone in the organization has to do both. So, so, um, so it, it becomes really interesting then to think about how one goes through managing change in, in times like this. Uh, I did a project a few years ago for, um, for a major hospital here in Canada and they, they wanted a, a change process uh, developed uh, that they could use in their organization because they'd just gone through a major change and it had not gone very well. So they said, what did we do wrong? What can we do? So as part of that project, I looked at the 45 leading change programs uh, around the world. It's quite easy to, uh, to find those on Google and to uh, research which are the most important. And they all had these six common uh, aspects to them. So when, when you're in an organization and you want to start change, what you need to do is think about what is the need for change. Uh, you need to have a vision for that change and, and, and decide what that, uh, what that change is going to be over time. You then need to figure out, well, how do I support that change moving forward? So once we start to implement it, you then need to design your change program. You need to actually start implementing the change and then you re need to reinforce and sustain that change over time. And then there's two other functions that you need to have in place that support all the way around along the entire change process. You need to communicate and, and you need to train. So, so by thinking about all of these core principles, you're able to get to the heart of, of what we do as management consultants. And 
for, for, for my own perspective as a management consultant, I'm always trying to find what are the best practices and then bring them down to their core. What is the simplest way we can provide these and present them to uh, our clients uh, so that they can use them in, in the absolute most effective way possible? So if you check out the blog, you'll see that the blog is written in the perspective of uh, us as consultants talking to the client. Uh, but here today, uh, really, this uh, this webinar is for management consultants, and uh, and I'll be I'll be talking about how we can use these principles uh, in terms of uh, of moving forward. So what's happening in in this global pandemic, or in fact, what happens anytime uh, a company or an industry is disrupted? Uh, this process, these, these key principles that one puts in place for a, for a good change process get disrupted because first of all, the organization did not identify that need. Uh, the organization isn't able to have a vision for the endpoint because they don't know when the endpoint is coming or even what it's going to look like. Uh, so without knowing those two things, it's pretty hard to design what that change process would be. It's hard to really implement what a change process would be. And of course, uh, uh, reinforcing and sustaining are, are also unknowns. So, so as the head of the organization, our client is faced with, with all of these unknowns going forward. Uh, they also don't know uh, what kind of training programs they should have in place be, be beyond the, the immediate uh, training that they have to have in place. So what, what is known? Uh, we know that we have to support uh, our employees and, and our clients, and we know that we have to communicate well. So in, in times of crisis, it becomes really important to focus in on, on, on those two areas. Um, I'd like to show you a, a map that uh, we've also developed, and this is not, nothing that I've, I've created. Uh, it, it, it exists in a lot of different places. It's called the change curve, and it's, it maps on one axis the morale or the performance of the organization, and then against that, it maps time. Um, and if you think about that change curve, there's a few steps that, that are in place. The first one is it's the current state. We're moving along, da da, everything's great. We're, we're doing well as an organization, and something happens. Uh, if if it's in normal times, uh, there's a decision made to start a change process. In in emergency times like this, it's an external event that that creates the change. Uh, in normal times, uh, once that change is made and announced that there's going to be a change, there's actually an uptick in morale and performance because everybody understands typically that there is a change that is required. Um, but when the change is actually announced, people then realize, oh no, it's me that has to change, not everyone else that has to change. So there's a bit of a shock and denial because people realize that they're going to need to change the way they do things. And in, in disruption times, uh, we, we, we experience this big time with, with, our, with our employees in the organization. As we move forward in the change process, then there's frustration because people are frustrated with having to do things in new and different ways. And at the very bottom of this, the low point in the organization, I call the valley of despair. Uh, this is when actually employees could get depressed in terms of we're never going to be able to get it. We're not going to be implement this change. Things will never change. If you can manage through that, if you can support your employees, if you can give them examples of success and really paint that vision for the future, you can have the really get them to start experimenting with the new way. Finally comes the acceptance stage and then integration. So we have a new current state, uh, which is integrated into the old one, which is a higher level of performance for, uh, for the organization. Now, here's the really interesting part about this, this change curve. In, in doing the research, we can see that from the 1960s, a, a, a person by the name of Kubler-Ross uh, developed a change curve, uh, developed um, a model of the stages of grief that people go through when they have fundamental changes, whether they lose a loved one, uh, it could be a, a divorce, uh, it could be the loss of a job. People have these stages that they go through. So they go through the denial and the shock. They go through the, with the frustration of having to live in a new way. They may get depressed, then they finally do have to experiment with living in a new way, acceptance and integration. So, so at the very heart of change model are some very fundamental human reactions about how people uh, deal with change, not only in their personal lives, uh, but in their work lives. 
So what you can then do is, 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 is really map those things against the six stages I showed you earlier, which are the identify the need, the create a vision, the build, support, design, implement, reinforce, and sustain, and so on. So what we really have then are, as consultants, a map to help uh, client organizations understand uh, how difficult it is to implement change, even in normal times, uh, when you have those factors that are not under your own control, uh, people are going to through, go through those same kinds of, of uh, phases in terms of how they react to the change. So as the head of the organization, we need to support them to be able to support their team uh, to, uh, to be able to move forward as quickly as possible and keep that, that valley of despair as high in the organization. And one of the things that I've found, and, and it's almost a mantra in major change programs that I've had over the years, is that communication is the absolute key. And, and, and the, the advice I give to clients is, is give this simple message to all of your employees. We will tell you what we know and then actually tell them everything you know. And we'll also tell you what we don't know. And especially in times of uncertainty, to have that message from the head of the organization that you know this is what we know, this is what we're doing, and these are the things we don't know, and this is what we're doing to try to understand. And then assure them that we'll tell you more as soon as we do know more, so that people have some idea that the messaging is coming in a regular way and that they will hear the truth as soon as it's available. The problem is if this kind of communication does not take place in the organization, people will speculate. And when people speculate, they will start talking with each other and soon that speculation becomes a rumor and then it, it soon becomes as a perceived reality. So it's critically important in organizations uh, to, uh, to avoid that. So that, this is the, uh, the introduction I wanted to give uh, to you on, on the change process. Uh, I'll now talk a little bit about uh, the way organizations have been reacting uh, on some data that I've gathered. And then we'll move into the management part. And uh, the name of our presentation was uh, Managing Teams in Turbulent Times. So I, I want to walk you through that part for the, uh, the last half, uh, last portion of our presentation. Uh, I'm planning on, on talking about 40 to 45 minutes uh, so that we will have a chance to for discussion. I'd love to get your input, input on any of these things, uh, but also to answer any questions for clarification that you may have. Because of course, in, in 45 minutes, we can, only, we can only introduce you to these concepts. We can't get into much depth. So, uh, so this, uh, this graph, uh, thanks to Flevi Pro, uh, who's done a lot of work in COVID-19 area, pulling together good models. And, and this one comes from, um, from work that was done by MIT Sloan uh, Management Review, uh, looking at, at the various phases that organizations go through. And McKinsey has also done some work in there. So they've combined uh, those two, that, the thinking from those two organizations into this one model, which is, which is really great. So there's six immediate steps that organizations need to take at the point of disruption. And uh, the, the point I make to my clients as we're going through this now in fact, I'll be doing a webinar on this specifically next week for, uh, for client organizations, is that this was a major, major disruption and it's a pandemic and we wouldn't expect to have a pandemic regularly. In fact, it's been a hundred years since the last global pandemic uh, of, of, of the scope that this one has been. Um, but we can expect that there's going to be disruption coming in the future. We'd already seen it in many ways uh, before the pandemic in terms of uh, economic slowdown globally. And we've seen it before, think, uh, think Uber uh, and what it's done to the transportation, think Airbnb and what it's done to hot the hotel trade. Disruption is coming and it's going to impact us in, in different ways. So this can be a wake up call to organizations to think about how do we use this crisis uh, to refine our thinking, uh, to be as effective as possible, so we can be as resilient as possible uh, moving forward and, and adapt to change more quickly. So uh, the first step always is, is protect your employees. And I'll, I'll be, I've got a graph coming up where I'll talk about how important employees are to everything. Uh, we'll set up a cross-functional team response. Generally, the information that you have and need for making decisions exists within your organization somewhere. So ensure that the various functions are, are involved in, in, in response. Um, ensure that you're taking financial liquid, liquidity. Uh, so someone's got their microphone on, so could, uh, please. Thank you very much. 
So it just sets up a little bit of feedback. So if we stay muted, that's very helpful. So the third point is to ensure sufficient financial uh, liquidity for the organization because we have to survive the crisis so that we can rebound when it's when it's time to uh, to move on to the next area. Uh, we can stabilize the supply chain. So so our how can we be assured of getting everything we need from the environment into our organization to continue business as well as we can. Uh, keeping that focus on the customer and, and how do we design and change around what the customer needs are going to be. And then the sixth one I think is really nice and, and we've seen this uh, big time in, in many organizations, how do we use the resources that we have to also help, uh, help the community. So thinking about where we start in the organization, we, we start thinking about employees. And, and how important it is that employees throughout the organization be engaged in the, in the work that, that they must do in order for the organization to survive and continue and then to be resilient as we go forward. And, and there's no question that, that uh, having engaged employees is important. You see these facts here that come from Gallup in two decades of research uh, that organizations in the bottom quartile uh, of engaged employees perform this much worse than organizations in, in the top quartile. So that's really important for us uh, to understand that we need to keep employees on side. And this is why we need to understand about how employees are impacted by change so that we can keep them informed and involved in the decisions we make and keep them engaged. But there's a here's the really important part about engagement. And this is a graph that I put together from data from Gallup uh, who, who uh, graphed in the United States uh, engaged versus not engaged versus actively engaged people in their organizations. And you can see since the year 2000 that uh, the level of engaged employees has been hovering around, you know, sort of uh, 20, 29, 30% uh, uh, of, of people. So that's one in three employees and organizations are engaged. Those are the go-getters, they're the ones that are doing things. And the other two thirds of the workforce are either not engaged, so they're kind of in there coming in, gather, gathering their paycheck, or actually in the gray area of this graph, actually disengaged. So they're, they're in many cases doing things to actively work against uh, the goals of, of the organization. And here's, here's, here's the, the key point, the key takeaway from this graph is that over those uh, uh, 17 years of data that I was able to gather from Gallup, this has not changed. So how is it possible that when we understand that employees with engaged employees are so much uh, better involved uh, and doing so much better work uh, that uh, that they're they're uh, that we're not actually able to make this curve look a little bit more like this to have increasing numbers of engaged employees across the workforce? We know some organizations can do it, uh, but some are, are not able to do it. And here's 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 the uh, the secret to this. What's happening is that in most organizations, uh, organizations are, are trying to improve the engagement of employees by focusing in on the symptoms of what I call churn in organizations, that, that activity that's happening in organizations that is not adding to the productivity of the organizations. And treating the symptoms, symptoms like poor communication, symptoms like poor collaboration in organizations is like giving an aspirin to treat a fever. So the fever is going to go for a little away for a little while, but you haven't treated the underlying disease. And as a result, uh, the, the, uh, the, the treatment is not going to be successful and the fever is going to come back. So the question that we have before us then is, is why is that? And, and the answer is it's because it all starts with the manager. And Gallup themselves have realized that uh, with the publication of, of their book on It's All About the Manager and this white paper, which they recently published earlier this year, The Manager Experience. So Gallup has come to recognize, as I've been preaching in since, uh, since I started this work in 2012, is that really it's managers that are at the heart of the organization and working with managers to ensure that they are doing their managerial leadership work is the critical aspect we need and that as heads of organizations need to realize, uh, need, to, uh, need to be in focus uh, in order to drive that engagement of their employees. So it all starts, uh, starts with, the, with the manager. Uh, this is uh, 
from uh, research that was done by uh, James Heskett and published in Harvard Review back in 1994 and then updated in, uh, in 2008. And he made this point, which was quite revolutionary when it was published, that employee satisfaction, which was it was called now, now we refer to it as employee engagement, drives customer satisfaction and that drives customer results. So if in fact we are able to uh, have more engaged employees, we will have more satisfied clients and that will drive profit for the organization because uh, uh, um, customers will stay and they'll be satisfied customers and they will do, give us repeat business. Um, Heskett in his paper did refer to managerial leadership, but I'm afraid and sorry to say that it was only one paragraph and he talked about the importance of managerial leadership uh, driving each one of these different phases throughout the organization. In doing our own research, which was recently published in a, in a peer-reviewed uh, journal, what we've been able to show is that managerial leadership is in fact the first step in this chain. And if we can improve managerial leadership in the organization, that's going to drive more employee satisfaction and that's going to drive customer satisfaction and, and therefore customer results. So really, the manager then is this link between our strategy, uh, what we want to accomplish over the coming years, and our execution, how well we're going to be able to execute what we need to do. And that counts on managers doing their managerial leadership work. Our own research from 2013 shows that managers, in fact, spend only 55% of their time doing value-added work. So managers aren't focusing in on the work that they need to do to create value uh, as a manager in the organization. And the key element that's missing here uh, is that we found that organizations that have higher levels of accountability are more successful as organizations. So it all does come down to, to accountability in organizations. And the key insight that we got here, I know I'm giving you a lot of information generally, but I want to give you this, this overview before we move into the next area, is that in terms of, of um, accountability for organizations and accountability for work, there's actually two different dimensions of accountability, which, which explains a lot. And you'll see what I mean in a second. Uh, what we found is that one dimension is felt accountability. So how strongly do I feel accountable for doing good work? And uh, in our survey of managers, and we've been doing this now for 10 years and it's been consistent, uh, almost 10 years uh, since 2012, so uh, eight years, uh, felt accountability uh, gets a score of 8.8 .8 out of 10 on a Likert scale. So, uh, so that's like an A for a term paper. Most managers feel strongly that they're doing important work and need to do that important work. But the second dimension of accountability is clarity of accountability. So how clear am I about those things for which I am accountable uh, in this organization and to whom I'm accountable for doing that work? And there we only get 6.9 out of 10 on a Likert scale. So as I always say to my clients, if, if, you're, uh, if you want to term paper, then you might be happy with, uh, with a C plus. Uh, but if you're running an organization, even in normal times, this is table stakes. This, this, you're leaving profit on the table because your, all your input factors, those things that are happening in the organization to produce value, are not happening as, happening as effectively as they could be. So by focusing in on this, you can really critically improve your managerial leadership work, and that's going to drive all of the other performance uh, indicators in your organization. So one thing we know for sure, and I tell my clients that they can know for sure, is that whether or not clear accountabilities are set, managers will take on. They're going to feel accountable for doing good work. So the only question that we have in the organization is, will they feel accountable for doing the right work? Are they going to be focusing in on the right work and the right work that needs to, uh, needs to happen? Um, so... Um, I'll just the uh, this slide wasn't supposed to have the uh, the build in it. So uh, what what I wanted to point out here is that uh, we've developed a process for for organizations uh, called the effective point of accountability, 
where we can help organizations ensure that people are focused in on the right work. And as management consultants, I think this is one of the most important gifts we can give to an organization is help them understand how to delegate that work clearly and specifically uh, moving down the organization in different sizes. And I've added in red here on the sides is that we must manage team members, whether you're the owner, whether you're uh, an executive, uh, general manager or directors, and whether you're frontline managers, all of these require, um, all, all of these teams require management. One of the biggest mistakes that is made in organizations is that the head of the organization develops a strategic plan in, in, consult, in, you know, in consultation with all of the appropriate people in the organization and externally. And then when it comes time to implementation, feels that he's hired really competent people to head up each of the functions and uh, he or she then lets them just get on with the work rather than clearly delegating to them how work is going to change starting tomorrow. And what happens is that different filters start to kick in with people not really being focused in appropriately in the work that they need to do. So these, these must manage uh, functions are not happening in, in the way that they should. So what I'm going to switch now is, is to show you the, the five key accountabilities that we've identified, again, drawn from a large number of, of different sources. But just as in change, there are fundamental principles for change programs. There are fundamental uh, principles for how one manages, what the managerial leadership work is. And here I'm not talking about um, what I call the softer skills like leadership or communication or, uh, uh, or, or team building, all of those things are really important. This is really at the core systemic level of how do you manage teams? And we've identified those, these five things that are requirements for effective management. Uh, one must plan, one must do value added work, one must set context and boundaries for team members and the team, one must delegate work clearly and specifically, and then one must establish feedback loops. So what I'd like to do in, in the remaining uh, time that we have left is, is just walk you through each one of these five and, and give you some examples uh, in these. And I, I do thank you. I see some questions are coming in on the chats and we'll get back to that at the end. And uh, if, uh, if you do have any questions or comments, uh, please do, do put them in and Rima will help us get those out so we can have discussions about that. So the first uh, uh, part, uh, the first and the most fundamental part is having a plan. So I always recommend to, to clients that every manager in the organization should have a plan. Now it doesn't have to be as complex as the strategic plan because the, the personal plan of the owner or the head of the organization is the strategic plan. Um, but then that the owner, the head of the organization needs to figure out you know, what is, what is the work that they, they need to do? So, so that plan becomes their personal plan. Uh, but then at each level below that, one needs to think about what are those things that I need to do for success in my function or my department or on my team over the coming period of time. Uh, the lower in the organization, the, the shorter the period of time. So uh, a, a lead manager might have a plan that goes out three, six, nine, maybe even 12 months. Uh, a director, a manager of teams of teams uh, might have a plan that goes out one to two years. But in, in, any effect, in any event, the important part is that they have this plan. And why do they need the plan? Uh, they need the plan because for success in the function, you need to have that vision for, for where you're taking the your, your part of the organization because that's what helps you focus in on what your most value added work is day in and day out. Uh, everyone above, above frontline employees has more work than they can do in a day. That's just the nature of work uh, because more complex work goes further out into the future. So every day, individuals need to choose what am I going to be doing today? What am I going to be focusing on today? And without that plan, without that, that, that prioritization of tasks, it's just so easy to, be getting, to get carried away by the urgent that you can't focus in on the important. And one of the most important parts of a manager's job is that managerial leadership, uh, but it's also the easiest one to delay. So we need to focus in on that. Uh, during a time of disruption, uh, the, the, this, this phase changes a little bit. So we move into a, a, a phase where the plan might be shorter rather than having as a vice president, a three-year plan as a vice president, I might now have 
what are we going to do in the next month or two months or three months to be able to survive this crisis and to be to be able to move forward similarly the head of the organization will be focused in on the let's get through this disruption now and let's do things we need to do so that we can prepare for the future um, uh, it's important to focus in on on what's in your control and have a number of if then statements coming out of that. So if this happens, then we're gonna do this. If that happens, then we're gonna do that. If this other thing happens, then we're gonna do this other thing so that there are contingency plans in place. This also helps hugely with the communication strategy so that, so that your employees throughout the organization understand uh, what's happening and, 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 and what, what, uh, what you're doing about it. And by you, I mean the head of the organization. Uh, the, the last point I make to clients here is, is to let them know that the crisis will pass. So yes, do position yourself and your team to be able to take off running when you can. So decisions that are made in terms of staffing and uh, cutbacks and uh, you know, surviving the crisis should be, must be taken, but they must also be taken with, with, the, with the vision of where we're going to be going when we come out of this so that you're, you're improving things and becoming more effective uh, and ready for that bounce back when uh, when um, when uh, uh, when the upturn comes back and and we always know the upturn will come we don't know when but we do know that it will be coming. Um, I just noticed somebody asked if the slides will be made available and yes I will make a PDF of these slides and uh, and uh, Rima and uh, Josema will 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 circulate these to you with a link to the uh, recorded version of the slide so so I should have mentioned that at the beginning thank you very much. The, uh, the second is um, uh, managerial accountability is do value added work. So at each level in the organization, we need to focus in on the value added work. What is the, the work that only I in this position uh, can do with the resources that I have available to me? Uh, because uh, this is what drives the organization. By focusing in on that value added work, we can create the most added value. Um, what I tell, I'm saying this a lot, but what I tell my clients, I'm giving you some insights to how we use this, is that if you're the head of the organization and your team members aren't focused in on their value added work because they're working sort of at a lower level, getting pulled down into the weeds, uh, no one is left to do that value added work except the owner. So what happens is the owner then gets pulled down into doing work that their team members should be doing. So then who's doing the really strategic execution thinking for the organization? It's, it's not happening. So somehow in, in thinking about the value added work, the, the process that you have in place for delegating accountability and authority needs to pull up the whole organization so that everybody's focused in on their value added work. Yes, everybody has to work in shorter term things as well, but don't ignore the, uh, the longer, uh, longer term things as well. In, in, in a time of disruption, um, the first step is to really identify how do I, as the owner of this organization, uh, do the most good for this organization and for the people in my organization. So what is the value added work that I need to focus in in this time of crisis? And then I need to set enough time aside to really focus in on doing that work. Again, we've got urgent all over the place in, in time of disruption, and it would be very easy to be running around all day long doing lots of probably pretty good work, but not focused in on the longer term impact for the organization and what I as the owner need to do to be able to implement change over, over that time. I also need to think about what is that value added work that my immediate subordinates can do and make sure that I have those conversations so that they appreciate from my perspective that I'm holding them accountable for that and they also need to focus in on, on the work at their level and not let themselves get pulled down. And, and by doing that, making sure that they realize this is important work for them to do and that they do, that they do, do this. So by asking myself the question, am I delegating the work clearly? And, and if the answer is maybe, then get in there and, and have those conversations because they're, they're really, really important uh, conversations. Uh, the third one is uh, in, in regular times is setting context and boundaries. So uh, the, the one thing I stress uh, when I get pushback from clients in, uh, about accountability and authority frameworks, it's because they feel that this is a command and control structure. 
And my point is that it's actually the opposite of that. By, by setting clear accountability and authority in each level of the organization, you're giving people the context that they need to be able to take initiatives and make decisions that are consistent with where you're trying to take the organization. So you're actually liberating people to do work, but within context, within a common understanding of what their role is, how their, their role is helping the organization move forward to implement strategy and to contribute to the uh, success of the organization. In times of disruption, this context needs to be reset because the focus of these people is, is, is more, more folk, needs to be more focused and the context is often much narrower because again, it's a time of disruption, resources are scarce and we really need to focus in on, on the key things that we need to do. So these are the kinds of questions that we can ask a client to help them understand what are the things I need to do to reset context for my immediate subordinates and what each of my immediate subordinates need to do to reset context further down the organization and then make, make sure that this, this chain is in place uh, all the way uh, moving down. Uh, the fourth area is, is delegation. And notice it's only the fourth area out of five. And delegation is where we actually uh, have that effective, clear delegation of tasks that are time bound, go out a certain time into the future, and the person understands their accountability for that and their resources. Uh, I, I like to use this formula that was developed by Elliot Jacks, a, a very uh, solid thinker in, in organizational systems. And he, he calls it QQT over R. So what is the quality? What is the quantity? What is the timeliness? And what are the resources that you have available to do this work? So when delegating, it's really, really important to do this. When I was a manager or head of organizations, the biggest mistake I ever made was always around this not understanding, not being clear enough, uh, particularly around the timeliness and the resources part. Where, where I would think I would be delegating somebody a job that might take uh, you know, four, four or five hours and they come back two weeks later and say, tell me all of the different things that they've been doing to try to, try to, to achieve the task because they're thinking at a, at, a, at a more detailed level from their role of their perspective. And even though I'm saying words that, that are delegating work of a support, certain type from my perspective, they're interpreting it in a different way. So, so being really, really crystal clear about this delegation is, is really important. In disruption, uh, whatever's happened, uh, whatever's in place in terms of delegation has also probably been disrupted or changed. So, so the objectives that might be in place to, for certain performance indicators to over the next quarter, over the next year, may, may need to be reinvestigated. So we have to go back and reset what your expectations are with each of your subordinates in terms of those things that, uh, that you've delegated. Um, the final one and, and the fifth one and, and a really important one that's often ignored is, is, is uh, implementing these feedback loops. So every manager in the organization, whether you're the head of the organization or on the front line, you need to have a manager subordinate feedback loop. So with each one of your immediate subordinates, you also have to have that feedback loop with the team overall. Um, you need to have a feedback loop with peer managers and other parts of the organization to understand what your accountability and authority are with respect to each other. And you need to have manager community uh, feedback loops. So if uh, your job impacts on the community, you need to have those feedback loops uh, in place as, as uh, also. Um, in disruption, uh, whatever you decide, um, you, you need to be sure that you, you're really, really working these feedback loops to build um, an understanding of what their input and their understanding of their work that they need to do to initiate changes for, uh, for making it through the crisis, but also uh, rebounding when, when the time is right. So accurate information is really important uh, and managers rely on it to do their job well. So getting this information down in a timely and thorough way is really, really important. And the newsletters, you know, the newsletters or, or the town hall meetings are helpful but it cannot uh, replace the chain of communication from the CEO to subordinates, from subordinates to directors, from directors to managers, because at each level in the organization, the communication needs, needs to be right-sized. What does this mean for our team? What does this mean for you individually? And the head of the organization simply cannot, no matter how good they are at messaging, give a message that's going to be relevant to everyone in the organization. So that chain of, 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 of communication needs to be done and thought through 
uh, very, very carefully. So ironically, as we're thinking about preparing for the bounce back, the irony is that the best way to ensure that you are as agile as a company as possible is to have the right structure in place. Uh, so structure isn't the enemy of agility. Uh, structure is the friend of agility because by having uh, the right organization design, uh, by having the right roles in the right levels of the organization, by having the right people in the roles, by having the accountability and authority structure, by having all of these things in place, you can create a system in your organization where people know what to do and they know who to ask uh, if they don't know what to do so that people really have the context for being focused in on their work. So in preparing for the bounce back, and again, this, this is a focus of, of a webinar I'm, I'm doing next week at Effective Managers. If ever, anybody's interested, let me know and I can, uh, I can send you the link for that. Or actually, I have a blog on my website um, from last week. Just go into that blog and it'll give you all the information you need. It's called uh, uh, The Resilient Organization. Um, so preparing for the bounce back, these are the six questions that, uh, that I ask my clients in terms of uh, once you've survived the crisis, uh, what are the six things you need to have in place? So the first one is, do you have the right organization design for the strategy, however the strategy might be changed or your business model changed uh, coming out of this? Do you have the right people in the right roles? Because one of the biggest uh, downsides we have in, uh, in the work that we do uh, with um, putting people into roles is that the person doesn't have the capability to work at the level to which they've been assigned. So that automatically draws them down into focusing on work that's too low a level for that role. So getting the right people into the right roles is critically important. Are your team members properly equipped? So do they, do they have the resources and the information and the time available to do what's, what's important? Many of the teams are going to be smaller because of layoffs or because of reassignments. So how do you ensure that people are, are equipped as well as they can be to do what needs to be done? Uh, have uh, have uh, all of the team members and people throughout the organization been de delegated appropriate work so that you as the head of the organization can focus in on your own value added work that becomes really, really important for them. And do you have a system for ensuring bench strength? So ensuring that as you have vacancies or people leave your organization, you have people that can come in uh, to work at, uh, at the right level of the organization and be promoted to jobs where they can be capable and, and successful at doing their work. And then finally, do you have a common language for delegating and collaborating? So this, this becomes the really important aspect of, of having a common language in the organization so people understand how they're delegated to be the effective point of accountability for work in different parts of the organization, but also for going across the organization so people have an understanding of how they relate to each other in terms of accountability and authority for supporting uh, peers in other parts of the organization when, when there's no managerial uh, relationship in place. So uh, that uh, brings me full circle through, uh, through, the, uh, through the commentary that I wanted to give you up front. I see there are a number of of questions. Uh, so we'll now move on to the discussion part. Uh, I just want to give, while, while people are putting in more questions, if you have them, just give you a little bit of, um, of promotional information here. Uh, next week, we have two amazing presentations called Coaching After Disasters from ICMCI. So watch watch uh, tomorrow. The uh, promotions for this will be coming out. And these are experiences that uh, were, um, uh, were uh, experienced by a management consultants after a major disaster in in uh, in a part of Canada actually, and uh, how what 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 uh, systems they brought in place to support uh, their client organizations to recover from the disaster. So this will have some impact for you that will be will be very helpful, and we, I've got lots of resources for you uh, on my website. So do check out effectivemanagers.com. You will get the hard copy of these, so you can just uh, uh, just take a picture of that, and that'll take you right to the right place. I have a lot of uh, uh, online resources in terms of YouTube uh, video as well. And uh, I've recently created, when I redid my website earlier this year, uh, there's a resources tab uh, for information. And if you notice right beside that tab, there's a consultant tab. So uh, you'll be able to access uh, resources that have been developed specifically for, uh, for uh, uh, consultants. So I'm going to stop my share now and uh, hand it over to, uh, to you, Rima.
Thank you, Dwight. I mean, that was heavy. It had lots of information. <laughs> I love the six questions. And uh, I believe uh, we do have questions in the chat box and I'm going to address them. Um, the first question is from Zakir Hussein, actually, our colleague from Bangladesh asking, when do you think the crisis will be over? Zakir, oh, that's a very tough question, my dear. <laughs> there is a tough question. We had a panel on that uh, a week ago. And, and um, I think it's in early June, we're gonna have a, a, another panel who's going to address um, a consulting after the crisis. You know, how do we prepare for the new normal? So, so we'll have experts better, better to answer that one. And the big question on that is, 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 is it a V? I think uh, generally people are saying it's not gonna rebound quickly. Uh, it's gonna be either a, a U or more of an L. So there is gonna be a period of time it'll take to rebound. So, uh, so time, time is, it, it's hard to say. Um, everything I've read so far says don't be expecting uh, the economy, especially the global economy, to be able to rebounding in this calendar year. And if we're lucky, uh, sometime in 2021, more likely towards the end of 2021. So it's it's anybody's guess right now, Zakir. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, that's what we, we are also thinking at this part of the world. Thank you so much for your answer. Very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Zakir. Um, our colleague, from Brazil, Christian also has a question for you. I understand that managing teams and accountability is naturally a must. Competence to become a manager. Why so few managers are aware of this? Why problem diagnosis in organizations then does not pinpoint this as a main problem? Yeah. Um, it, this, this, is, <laughs> this is at the heart of the work I've been doing since I started the Effective Managers Company because we identified in our research that managers are not doing their managerial leadership work. And, and there's two fundamental reasons for that, and I'll be addressing these in, in this webinar I do next week. The first one is that there's no common profession of management. I mean, there, there, there's, there's some courses on like MBA address management, but how do you actually manage people in this organization is, is done by watching who does managing in other places of the organization. So you kind of learn from those who have managed you. And because so there's so few good managers, most of us are not having good role models in the organization. The second part is very often when, when people are promoted into managerial leadership roles, uh, they, they don't have the capability to actually do the work at that level of complexity because it's completely different uh, the nature of work of a manager is completely different from the work of a frontline employee. So we often have managers in roles that, that simply are more successful at doing the frontline work and therefore they're always on the floor doing that frontline kind of work. So it's really complicated and, and helping our, our, our clients to understand that focusing in on getting capable people into managerial roles and then training them in managerial leadership is, is really, really important. Thank you, Dwight. Um, another question from Pikelem. We all know Pikelem. Hi, Pikelem. Thank you for being with us. Um, Dwight, what is the role of the cross-functional response team, slide nine, during and after COVID-19 period, which is the bounce back? Especially yeah. most of the team members or managers are operating online. Yeah. Um, again, a very, very important question. I, I think we're going to find that a lot uh, of teams are going to continue working uh, virtually from home uh, for a much longer time because as social distancing is in place in the workplace, they're not going to be able to house as many employees as they had. And I think the experience uh, over the last two months, three months, four months, has shown that people can work very effectively remotely, as many of us as management consultants have been able to demonstrate for, for a long time now. So this has really kickstarted the movement to more work at home. So this is going to make the job of the manager uh, more critical in terms of how do I keep in touch with set contacts, uh, get, uh, get feedback from my managers in, in, in a good way uh, over a period of time. Uh, and it also makes the cross-functional work, you're exactly right, more, more, more difficult because you can't just get together over coffee to talk about how we're going to collaborate. So, so it means uh, managers need to be more thoughtful and, and take more, more considered decisions in terms of how do I build and maintain this cross-functional uh, collaboration because it, it's critically important. We need to depend on others in other parts of the organization for success in our roles. Uh, so managers at whatever level in the organization need to really focus in on this more than ever before. 
And maybe that's why we should have more dedicated who do the work and not just come in for the paycheck, right? <laughs> exactly. More engaged <laughs> employees is going to help a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, Vladimir Baruch is asking us how to organize mentoring for consultants in such circumstances. How to organize mentoring for consultants? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so how how consultants would be mentored by each other, or how consultants would mentor clients? I guess both are important. <laughs> both are important, yeah. but I believe he's talking about mentoring for consultants. Okay, so I, I think this is um, this is the beauty of of ICMCI and this global network that we have of of management consultants around the world that all have you know, our CMC level of designation uh, assures us this level of, of capability. Um, the, the, the work we've been doing at ICMCI now to, uh, to have these weekly uh, seminars is a way of building collaboration. Uh, we've also got our, our CMC global directory where CMCs who want to collaborate internationally can be in contact. So I, my, my advice is, is reach out to colleagues in, in either in your country or in different parts of the world. So, so we need to have these mechanisms in place. If, if I have a question about something, I, I don't hesitate to, to reach out to a colleague wherever they are and say, you know, what, what do you think about this? And, and they, always, they always answer. So let's collaborate. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's how we can get mentoring and, and share advice and, and learn from each other. And actually, this is what those seminars uh, are for. It's for assisting consultants um, to manage this, to manage uh, the relationship with their clients. And, and we're trying to put in subjects that would provide some mentoring to the consultants in our network. So I hope you're also benefiting from those. Um, another question from Zakir. Do you have any idea about COVID manager or an effective manager to handle COVID crisis? I mean, Zachary, do you mean a specific manager or do you mean qualities that such a manager should have? Actually, uh, thanks, uh, Dwight. Actually, uh, a lot of things have mentioned about uh, a manager to handle this crisis. But if he has uh, like five or three great points that these are the basic skills, this uh, must be possessed by the uh, manager during this COVID crisis. He has already explained a lot of things, but I want to have bullet points, maybe five <laughs> basic uh, attributes. Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you. Um, it, uh, I think the first point on this is that the effective point of accountability for the COVID response is the owner of the organization. So it, 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 that's the single point of accountability. That's the person that has the uh, authority to impact the whole organization and to make decisions. So it can't be delegated down. But each manager needs to work in a different way in a time of crisis than they do in, uh, in, in normal times. Uh, and, and everything gets accelerated in terms of the importance and the urgency of, of making decisions well. So having these, these effective points of accountability and clearly delegating what people are accountable for uh, in their role and what they must focus on becomes really, really important, uh, whether it's COVID-19 or whether it's disruption from, from some other source. So I, I think to me, the, bull, the bullet points are those, uh, are those five requirements. Each manager needs to be, be doing their planning. They need to be really focused in on their value added work. They need to set context and delegate and, and really work those feedback loops. So, so, um, so check out some uh, additional articles uh, that I have on my website. And I think it'll give you some insights into what that checklist would look like. Yeah, thank you, Duet. Actually, let me share what is happening in this part of the world. We are from the uh, least developed exactly. countries. Yeah. Um, I just so. need you to be quick because we're only seven minutes away and I have three more questions to address from others, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll finish it less than a minute. Thank so you. this issue of using this ICT tools, you know, like we are having this meeting over Skype webinar and so this is also part of the uh, like manager's facility to reach out these people when they work from home. So uh, that's the issue that I actually wanted to mention. Thank you. It's the ICT facility uh, down the line with your colleague, you know, when they are not working at home, they are working in the office, rather they are in the, at home and working from home. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zakhar. Um, 
Adelwin has a question. Excellent presentation, Dwight. My question is a complex one as well. How does, how does both national and organizational culture factor into the managerial process described in your presentation? Um, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. And um, I, 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 I come back to, uh, to Rima's introduction about, uh, about the global footprint of, uh, of effective managers. And the way I've dealt with that is, is not to pretend that, that I could have the answer to those kinds of questions because cultures do change. Um, what I do know is that there are some fundamental human systems that, that, that are, are the way people react in, in all situations. So, you know, we all, we, all, we all have families, we all love each other, we all have, are impacted by grief in the same way as, as I gave it in that example. So, so the role of the manager in the organization is to work with other human beings in terms of how do we collaborate together in this organization to do successful work. But culture has a huge impact on that. So, so I've always partnered with local firms where I can bring the, the, the best practices in terms of how do we do what needs to be done uh, and, and how do we have methods and approaches to help organizations be more successful, but how it's applied uh, will, will, will vary and it's the local CMC that I trust that has that knowledge so I can give them the principles and then they figure out how to implement it in the best way in their country because it, it has a huge impact and we can't pretend it doesn't because we won't be successful otherwise. And that is the RCMCR example as well. Um, yes, a, question yeah, from, <laughs> a question from Vera, how would you define accountability? How do I define accountability? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. Actually, I'm surprised. I've never had that question before, and the reason I'm surprised is is when I started doing research into accountability, uh, I, I read as much as I could for almost a year, and and I found that there was only five researchers in the entire world working in this one, and each one had a different definition of accountability. So so we really focus in on accountability is 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 um, being specifically accountable for for doing for work and action so we have we're accountable for producing output uh, and the actions for producing that output to a specified other and and the specified other becomes really important as well because accountability isn't generated by self accountability is delegated by another one someone else in the organization who who is the um, the manager of accountability. So, so it's really uh, providing output that has been delegated by my manager uh, with specific quality, quantity, timeliness, and, and the resources that are necessary to do that. Now that's, that's and, and there's two, two parts to it. I'm sorry, Rima, just quickly, there's two parts to it. It's, it's managerial accountability and authority, which we talked about today, but we also have to talk about cross-functional accountability and authority. So I've, I've got on my YouTube channel, there's a five minute video answering the question, what is accountability? So I, I've kind of fumbled it in 60 seconds, but in the five minutes, you'll get a really good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Dwight. Um, I, I still have more questions coming in. So everyone, if we stay like, for extra five minutes after the hour, do bear with us. Um, Gary O'Brien has a question. As an implementation consultant and trainer, the teams that I'm working with are now all working remotely. Do you have any advice for engaging consulting remotely? Um, I've, I've been working on this very hard at, at Effective Managers because most of my work is international and required international travel, which is not possible anymore. So, <laughs> so I've, I've, uh, in January, I started working on, on moving all of my work to, to virtual. And what I have found is that this kind of a platform, in fact, I use Zoom for my own, my own business, is 95% is of what you need for, for doing work because it's, it's interacting with people on a face-to-face -face basis. The key, uh, if I had one advice, is the key is to make sure that from the client side that they have uh, decent equipment in terms of, of a microphone, a screen that's, uh, that's big enough, and, and a camera that's capable enough for you to be able to see them in, in that room. Uh, and if you have those things, then, uh, then, um, then if they're together, then that works. If they're not together virtually, as you've asked the question, then each person that's in the, in, in, in the meeting needs to have that camera and that microphone and be able to connect so that you can see them. This, 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 these pictures become really, really important. The voice only 
gets you maybe 70% of the way there, and, and the video feed gets you the, the, the next 20, 25% of the way there. Think of it, everyone. We've all been into each other's houses in the past month and a half. We've all seen everyone's office and what it looks like. And we've seen each other maybe more than we would have if it was uh, a face-to-face -face meeting. So we're getting, we are there. Uh, a question from Lubomir Trakovsky, Macedonia. Hello, Lubo. Um, crisis from external environment could create internal crisis between people in company, managers and staff how to treat crisis in organization with crisis in people, especially when created internal crisis will impact personal values. So it's about crisis within the people, within the company, managers and staffs, and, and, and how it will impact the values. Yeah, this, this, this comes down to the cross-functional accountability and authority framework. So, so in, in, in organizations, there's incredibly high um, interdependence across organizations and that's been growing over the last few years so even the the smallest organizations uh people in one part of the organization depend on people in other parts of the organization for success in their work and and you're ab absolutely correct when there's a crisis externally people start focusing in on how can i be as successful as possible in what i need to do and often forget about that cross-functional how do i support others that that also need need to be involved and, and the, the, the problem in most organizations is that uh, people are left to try to work that out on their own. And, and, and there's, there's literally no way to do that because each person, if they're focused in on what do I need to do for success in my role, you're just gonna build silos and, and, and it's gonna get worse over time. So the head of the organization needs to be involved and needs to have an issues resolution process to really be clearly uh, inform people about what their collaborative approach needs to be, set context in a different way than what we've been talking about today, and make sure that if people don't understand that they don't have to kind of compromise or, or, or fight it out, but they, they have an escalation procedure until you can find a person who can make a decision about what's best for the organization as opposed to what's best for me in my role. Thank you. Um, a question from Maria, when do you think companies will be ready to think about designing crisis risk management plans and business continuation plans as part of prevention strategy prior to future new crises? Yeah. I, I would hope now, <laughs> I would hope this would be a lesson learned. Um, many, many of us in the consulting profession are focusing on risk management and have been working with clients over the last couple of decades to really try to get more emergency preparedness plans in place in organizations. So, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that this has been a wake-up call and that organizations will think about risk management and, and, and how they should react and be prepared for the future. And I'm, I'm all about this resilience in the organization. How do you make sure that you have the right structures and systems in place so that you can be as flexible as possible uh, going forward? Thank you, Dwight. Um, I believe most of the rest are comments. I'd like to read a few. Uh, Christian is telling us, I have studied this issue and participated in several of your webinars for the past five years at least, and every time I learn something more. Thank you very much and congratulations for your presentation. Thank you, Christian. That's Thank well you. said. Um, Zakir is also saying, hot yes, congratulations. Your presentation has been very interesting and the need for the time. So, thank you. Everyone is saying thank you. Aldwin, okay. Savji, um, lots of thank yous there and everyone's appreciating your contribution, Dwight, and they're considering it an excellent presentation. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of your comments, for being there, for being part of our seminars. This is, this is what makes us actually stronger and makes us happier uh, in providing services to you. So thank you very much. Um, Omar is saying that he will join the next webinar. Good, we already have a registrant there. Um, everyone is saying thank you, okay? Um, well, I mean, thank it, you to it everyone. goes on it's, and on and on. Yeah, no, that's great. I, and yeah. I really, really appreciate that. And it was fun taking off my ICMCI hat and putting on my consultant hat today and, and talking about my practice. So uh, I really enjoyed that. And thank you for the, the great questions. And uh, you have my contact information in, in the slide. So if anyone wants to reach out with additional questions, feel, feel free. I'm, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. 
And there's two other things. Number one, you know that some of your comments will end up on our social media. We will quote you in there. So thank you for uh, providing them and they will be used. Um, one last request is if you may please put on your video so that we take the group photo, if that's okay. I'm gonna take the first one. Okay. Any more that are going to open their video? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. I really Thank appreciate you. the time and uh, have a great rest of your day, whatever time zone you're in. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. I join, don't forget to join us next week. The announcement will be sent to you all either today or tomorrow. And you will get also the presentation in PDF, as Dwight promised, the link to the video that we will upload. And you keep safe and keep well, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.